together today on behalf of Goldschmidt. I'm the sales guy, live in Texas, work for Nick on behalf of selling the brand. Uh, and uh, Nick is coming to you from California at, at his uh, offices in Hillsburg. Um, many of you may know Nick from his uh, passes through Texas one or two weeks a year. We're glad to have him. We missed him earlier in April and uh, unfortunately don't get the chance to see him this year. So uh, we've been doing some of this to, to get through that. I, uh, I think that uh, it's uh, time to point out that there is a chat option for all of you at the bottom. We hope you'll make this a social event. Many of you may follow Nick on social media in general, whatever the platform you choose. If you're not following him, watching him kick dirt around the country, uh, around the, the world, so to speak, uh, you, uh, you should make him a follow. He's one of the better ones in, in our industry for sure. Uh, so please include all the attendees in your chat today. And I think with that in mind, Nick, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell us that short version of the bio. Yeah, g'day. I hope you guys can hear me all right. Um, my name's Nick Goldschmidt. I am a, uh, I'm a winemaker and tractor driver, and we're sheltering in place, SIP, shelter in place. That's what we do in California. And my son has just parked his car right in my window, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, so uh, this is a picture of, in Healdsburg, we've been running um, porch photos and... Uh, so they've been running around town taking photos of everyone's porches and that's myself on the left of course that's my one of my daughters she's number five in birth order and she's standing there with her prom dress because she's in eighth grade and so she won't be graduating the normal way she won't be uh, uh, going to the prom and one of my sons is at university in UNR Reno and so he's at home too he's mainly playing video games that's why he's sitting there and that's my wife Yolan and uh, she is uh, sheltering in place with us as well, working from home. A little bit about who I am is uh, I am from New Zealand, for those who haven't met me before, but I trained in Australia. I went to Chile for the first time. I was sort of the first gringo down there in 1988, 89. Pinochet was still in power. And so I have a lot of uh, stories about that. Uh, I came to California the first time in 1989, returned in 1990 and became the winemaker at Simi Winery in California and I was the winemaker there for 14 years. During that time we were owned by Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton sold us to Constellation in 1999. And uh, I subsequently left in 2003 and went to the world largest wine company called Allied de Mac at the time. Uh, Claude Bois, William Hill, let us speak Gary Farrell, Mum, Bonavista, Camo Viejo, Marcus Dianza. Anyway, there was 58 wineries in seven countries. And then we were sold to Jim Beam and that included Guys of Peak Wild Horse and a few other brands as well. And then we got sold to where we split between Pernod Ricard, who were French, and Constellation. And of course, uh, they welcomed me back, but I decided not to. And so in 2008, I went out on my own. And so today I work in uh, six countries. I consult uh, in those places. We also own vineyards in four countries. And um, uh, what else do we do? I drive tractors and also an inventor. So that's what we do. I think I covered it, Mark. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if, for those of you looking uh, now, you see the four wines that Nick's going to uh, fill us in on. Uh, hopefully you got out and got a chance to get your six pack of wine and join us. And uh, that's a handy way to shop these days. Uh, and I think that it's important, Nick, to mention after telling us about all the, the places you make wine, that there's some common characteristics to what you do in all these places. Give us a few uh, few bullet points on uh, you know what what you take to the vineyards and to the winery with all these places yeah I think that that's a really uh, interesting point mark because part of being a um, consultant is doing what you think is a consultant you know in terms of making wine and defending quality and and discussing vineyards etc but the worst thing about being a consultant is making sure that you represent the culture of the place and the winery of the place that you're working in. Because the last thing we want to do is go down to Chile or Argentina or, or even Australia where they make reds and just say, hey, you know, I'm from Napa. I don't want all your wines to be made like a Napa winery. And that used to be the case. And I fought it very vigorously. Uh, that was when we had the, the various wine writers that you've all heard of saying, um, you know, we want to get 100 point wine, 90 point wine or whatever it is. And we have to make it sweet and alcoholic like we do with Cabernet and Napa. 
So I think it's important to realize that not only do you have to make good wine, but you also have to make good wine from a place. And the big difference for me is alcohol. And so once you hit about 14 and a half alcohol, I'm excluding Zinfandel. I'm letting Zinfandel have a free ride here. But once you hit 14 and a half alcohol on Cabernet, I can make a Cabernet from a Clarenval in Australia, the Uco Valley in, in Argentina, the Maipo in, in Chile, or at Napa, Alexander Valley in California, and line them all up for you and ask you to pick which is which. And you can't tell the difference. It's only when you become lower in alcohol that the fruit essences, and you know, this is a, Grape is a fruit, you know, that's, we're making alcohol out of fruit. We're not making an alcoholic beverage per se. This is a conversation piece uh, and a point of difference. If, if we don't make these wines different, we might as well, no offense, we might as well be drinking Coca-Cola. And so it's important that not only do we represent the country, the place, and of course the people, because the winemakers themselves also have their own input into how those wines end up being so i think respect at all levels is really really important great so making wine in all these places do uh already question from two different people has come in uh heather in houston and liz in austin are asking where's the hardest place you make wine um i haven't found it yet <laughs> i uh, think i think uh the hard well let's face it the easy the easy places um the easy places uh, have already been done. I mean, wherever there's roads or ports. So if you think about the traditional new world countries, they're all, and even Bordeaux and Burgundy, I mean, they're on rivers. I mean, those places have been done. The hardest places to make wines now are, are the challenging places. And as we get more and more global uncertainty, so we're looking for more places of extreme. So, you know, can we grow grapes on the 50th parallel? Well, we can, as long as it's a, it's a um, a climate that's moderated either by a lake or an ocean. And since most of the ocean stuff has been done, we have to go inland. So I don't know if you know what 50th parallel means, but that would be um, deep, deep south in Chile and, is, and um, up in Kamloops, say in Can well, Kamloops in Canada is about 48th parallel. So 46, 48 parallel, 50 might be a bit extreme. And then altitude. So we make a wine in Argentina at, at 6,000 feet, well, five and a half thousand feet. Yeah, that, that, that's cool climate. I mean, even though it's a, a less latitude, the altitude is so high that you still get that fresh fruit element. And that's really what I'm seeking as we move forward in terms of trying to make wines with a difference. So the two most important things for me, are, we can talk about a little bit later, is the age of the vineyard. So how old is the vine? Can it be naturally balanced? And then these extreme places. And so I think those are the two really important pieces. All right, I'm going to get out of the way and let you take it from here. Boulder Bank, let's go. Put your seatbelt on, people. <laughs> All right, I'm plugging in. If you've got a question, uh, Mark, you'll have to uh, show your face again. All right, so with the wines we're going to go through are the, the Boulder Bank Sauvignon Blanc from Fitzroy. This is one of our own vineyards, and uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, Chardonnay, which is from the Russian River, which we call Singing Tree. Catherine, who is... Our middle child, well, she's one of a twin, she's number four. And then Fidelity, which is uh, Zinfandel, if we have time, we'll, we'll, we'll um, come back on that. So this is a map of New Zealand for those who haven't been to New Zealand before. I'm from right up here. I'm from this, uh, I'm from an area, um, well, north of Auckland. Auckland is where I went to school, of course, but uh, my parents were up in, in Northland for quite some time. But the vineyards that we work on are here in Marlborough. And uh, this plane flight is one of the scariest plane flights in the world because this piece here is some of the windiest uh, area in the world between the, it's called the Cook Strait between the North and the South Island. So the plane flies super high and then sort of plummets to the earth once they get over the, uh, over the ocean here. There's the Wairau Valley, which is where we are. There's the Awateri Valley and Ward. So there are three valleys, but two of them grow grapes. In the Awateri Valley, they're mainly in here, which is protected from the frost. And here where we are, we're either on the, um, by the Richmond Range. Uh, this is the, what we call the Rapara series and then the Brancott series. So these are the glacial soils and these are the river soils. So the glaciers came off what are called the Wither Hills and formed these river valleys. And then we have these um, river soils that uh, come off uh, thanks to the Wairau. And the, you can see that it's completely protected. We have the, the Alps here the Wither Hills here and the Richmond Range here. 
So we get protected from the winds and the rains quite effectively. Uh, for those who have never been down here, this is the Wairau River. This is Renwick. There are two main towns, Renwick and Blenheim. Blenheim is further up here. All the roads run east-west. There's New Renwick, Middle Renwick, Old Renwick, and Rapara. This is Rapara Road. This is our vineyard uh, right here. You can see this green patch. This is a little hotel. There's a reason why it's green is because we uh, haven't disked yet. We have the sheep running in here at this particular time when this photo was taken. And we're in an area called the Golden Mile. So if you come back over to this photo here, this is uh, Cloudy Bay, where my arrow is now. This is Alan Scott. You drive up this road here. This is called Jackson's Road. You turn left. This is Paratai, which is Matua's famous vineyard. This is Stonely, which is a very famous winery as well. And then we get into our property here. Um, so this, is, this area is called the Golden Mile. This is one of the best soils in, uh, in the uh, Wairau. We um, machine harvest. And that's the Richmond range there. We machine harvest because, of course, Marlborough is like 80% Sauvignon Blanc and all the Sauvignon Blanc gets ripe within uh, 10 days. And you can see that we're very quick. We take it off. We, we, uh, we normally harvest at night, so it's nice and cold. And then we quickly get it to the winery. You can see that um, uh, this is machine harvested. And, it, and it's uh, very important that we do that because we want to have at cold temperature, the skin contact is not that great. So we don't get any astringency or bitterness. In fact, the machines that we have these days are actually better than hand harvesting. I know it's hard to believe, but we can actually take the rachis off the cluster. We can sort the berries using infrared if we so choose and very accurate. Here's a quick little video of running through the uh, vineyard. Here we are at the Fitzroy Vineyard, just driving down the uh, road. This is the way we do it in New Zealand. We make our roads just wide enough for our rental cars to fit down. You can see we're not quite ready yet. A little bit of time to go. We've still got the waxy outside of the Sauvignon Blanc. And uh, so we're close to Verizon, but not yet. Anyway, another gorgeous day in Marlborough. Driving down the roads. Fitzroy Vineyard, 2018. So this is a picture of the bottle. This is uh, what, uh, I should come off screen and drink with you. <laughs> this is a picture of the label. This is um, the flax that's from the far north of New Zealand. So it's quite thin up there because it's more subtropical and the stones are obviously from the vineyard. Fitzroy is the name of my uncle. The two unique things about this wine is that it's single vineyard. So most of the other New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs that you would drink are blends. And we don't sell it to the British because the British drink more New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc than anyone else. And so, and we all know what British eat. It's not as interesting as uh, what we eat. We eat more Mediterranean food. So we try to make the Sauvignon Blanc a little bit more fleshy and rich, um, but more weight. So I don't like people saying it's grassy or asparagus. I think more of it is, is a passion fruit, melon sort of character. And this wine just got 91 points. Um, this is the 2019 vintage. Jumping into Chardonnay, unless there's any questions, Mark, please feel free to jump in. Um, the, we, have, we make two Chardonnays. We're just going to talk about one of them today. This is called the Singing Tree. This is uh, a tree in our backyard, which you'll see a little video of in a minute. And it has to be one of the best value Russian River Chardonnays on the market, considering the, the price of the fruit, etc., cetera, and uh, its pedigree, which we'll talk about. So uh, this is the center of the universe. This is Healdsburg. For those who didn't know, that's where the world revolves around. Uh, beautiful little town. We have Alexander Valley to the north. We have Russian River to the south. We have Dry Creek. Sorry, this is Dry Creek. We have Dry Creek uh, to what we consider to be the west. This is the Alexander Valley to the north, uh, Chalk Hill, and Russian River. So we make uh, three Chardonnays. We're going to be talking about Singing Tree today, which comes from down near Sebastopol and uh, really, really cool, unique area. This is the town of Sebastopol. This is the vineyard. So these are the, this is the fruit that we take. This is uh, fruit that goes to Kokomo. Kokomo is, is a, uh, a direct-to-consumer brand, very, you know, one of those um, uh, big-time brands. And then the vineyard up to this area here, this goes to um, uh, Costa Brown. And uh, down here, this is another... Uh, smaller winery takes the rest. So pretty unique vineyard, pretty unique site. <coughs> this 
to the singing trees at our house. They are full of small birds and they are incredibly loud. Yeah, it's hard to see in that video, but man, those birds squawk like crazy, but we didn't think the squawking tree was uh, as, as interesting as we'd call it the singing tree. Um, the soil is really unique. So I mentioned briefly at the beginning, one of the most important things is old vine, and that's exactly what this vineyard is. So this does not have, this does not have the characteristics that most Chardonnays that you drink today have. Most Chardonnays that you drink today are cloned. They all, the, the definition of a clone is you can track everything back to one plant. And the reason why they did that was because they wanted to make sure that the virus level was low, the, um, and the vines uh, produced a lot of crop and very, and a very quick accumulators of sugar. I'm not really interested in that. I mean, my home at Simi was originally when I started at Simi was all about Chardonnay. And so we have these things called mass selections. And these are very old Chardonnays that were planted in the 70s and 80s. These vineyards were never replanted, even though they're on a rootstock that is not resistant to phylloxera, which is the thing that caused the problem. So most of the vineyards that were planted from 1990 on are all cloned and are all on different rootstock, new rootstocks that are resistant to phylloxera. So trying to find these old vineyards is really unique and I'll explain a little bit in a minute about why. As far as winemaking, we, we used to make the wine 100% neutral barrel. These days we're about 40, 50% concrete. It's not that I think concrete is cool or interesting, but it is part of my history because in 1982, believe it or not, which was my first vintage, we made everything out of concrete or in concrete tanks. We used to get uh, large sewer pipes and uh, dig a big hole, get four pipes, throw them in the ground, put a concrete floor in the bottom. And that was our concrete fermenter. And it was really good because we had the soil around the tank and that was our natural cooling. But of course, these days we don't make wine like that. We're far more sophisticated. But going back to the concrete is part of my style I don't necessarily get it from concrete, but it is enhanced by the use of concrete. And that's this mineral flinty style. For those who are drinking it right now, you drink that, you put that wine in your mouth and you get that cacta, you know, that am I hungry, am I thirsty? And that's really the sensation that we're trying to, trying to achieve. For those who know what malolactic is, we do very limited malolactic and then all the wines are vegan because we don't do any additions or filtration. This is the Goldridge soil that I was illuminating, uh, alluding to. This is, a, it's like a talcum powder. So if you go on my YouTube channel, you can uh, see me do this, pick up the soil, and it's uh, very um, dusty and the phylloxera cannot live in it. You can see the age of the Chardonnay too. We talk about old vine Zinfandel and sometimes we talk about old vine Cabernet, but I don't know how often or very rarely do we talk about old vine Chardonnay, but this is an example of it. And then the last photo is really what mass selections are all about. This is a photo showing a cluster where you've got big berries and small berries in the same cluster. So these, uh, this is what makes a mass selection or a field selection interesting. If we were to take a photo of a cloned cluster, all the berries would be the same size and the, uh, the, ber the cluster would be extremely tight. So I find that with mass selections, we have better balance between flavor and tannin. And of course, we have tannin in um, Chardonnay as well. The berries are a hell of a lot smaller, as you saw. Whereas in a clone, we get larger yield and faster gatherers of sugar. Because remember, these clones were selected by the, the growers originally to produce tons. And also they want sugar to accumulate quickly so that they're not picking Chardonnay in November because that's when we start to get rain. So stylistically today, if you were to make a Chardonnay from a clone, so this is not the style of singing tree. This is what you would typically buy. If you think about a wine in terms of structure, that would be acidity and CO2 or things that make a wine tight in the mouth, maybe. You know, if you drink a Sauvignon Blanc, when you're drinking that Sauvignon Blanc, it's going to be more structural. And then Chardonnay would be more textural. The old style of Chardonnay where we had big, fat, buttery, ML, woody Chardonnays. Those wines are what I call textural. Okay, so... Amy, a couple of questions are coming in regarding uh, the Russian River uh uh, one, the soil. Is the Gold Ridge indicative of the whole Appalachian or is it specific to just some of the vineyards? No, mainly to, good question, really good question. That is normally in the Sebastopol Hills region up through Vinehill Road. Most of the vineyards in Russian River are, are on Wachika, 
which is a which is more of a loam. So it's it doesn't have the sandy loam. It's more of a clay loam, and the rest is a Franciscan series, which is um, which has got less water holding capacity, and uh, um, and has more clay. Sorry. Hey, and without pulling out a video, can you give us a brief definition of cane pruning? Oh my God. <laughs> I can, I, hang on, let me just stop. So, so if you were to um, cane prune something, you would, uh, um, you can have, uh, if you train, so a vine is typically trained like this. So this is what we call a bilateral cordon. And so uh, there are two ways to basically farm. I'm gonna make this real simple. So you can uh, train a one-year-old cane along the wire like that, and you have one bud, one bud, one bud. And each one of those buds produces a cane directly, straight, and they're usually about a fist apart. And so we like that separation. It's very easy. We don't have a lot of congestion. The other advantage on cane pruning is the vine is not a big, thick arm, because when you have a big, thick arm, there's a lot of power in that arm, and it's trying to produce extra shoots. So leaping into a spur prune vineyard, you've got this big thick arm, you've got a lot of power and it starts producing all these extra shoots. So you prune two buds, two buds, two buds, two buds. And so you can imagine you have a lot of congestion and then you have these water shoots or these non-count shoots that appear at this time of the year. This is what we call suckering. If you go on my YouTube site, you'll see me doing a suckering video. And uh, so, there's a lot of congestion. You've got to do a lot more manual work. So the advantage of cane pruning is that you don't have to do a lot of manual work during the season, but it takes longer to prune it. On a spur prune situation, much quicker to prune, but a lot more work during the season. The dis the, and the other disadvantage, of course, is you get a lot of uh, congestion. And regarding the Dutton Ranch uh, version of the singing tree, uh, very small production, I assume? Very small production. We only make about three, 400 cases of that. It's also planted to what I'm going to explain in a minute called the C selection. So it's also a mass selection, also on a Goldridge Sandy Loam, but it's in Green Valley. And Green Valley is the coldest place in all of, uh, in all of um, Russian River to grow. That's down near Grayton, for those that know where that is. All right, thanks. Let's see if I can jump back on to uh, where I was. Okay, so when we talk about warm fruit, we talk about pineapple. As we get cooler, melon, stone fruit, pip fruit, like apples and pears, citrus and grassy, if you can imagine that. So today, because everything is usually cloned, we only get this white peach. How many times do I hear somebody go, oh, my Chardonnay's got white peach character? I'll tell you what, that's the first thing that makes me want to stop drinking it. I've had enough white peach and I've had enough apples and pears. So I want to have something unique and different. And that's why I never wanted to make Chardonnay. And HEB was such a great partner of ours. And that's how we started making Chardonnay because we knew where this vineyard was and I really wanted to work with it. So great partnership and really helped us start Singing Tree Chardonnay, which today has become a very important brand in our portfolio. So this is a style of Singing Tree. It's a lot more structural than, uh, so you get a little bit more zip factor because we pick it a little bit earlier relative to sugar, relative to what you'd get from a clonal situation. And you get a much more uh, bigger extreme in fruit. So this is called, we had names for these mass selections or field selections. And this one's called C, S-E-E. -E, and it produces more of a melon character, passion fruit, subtropical. It's not pineapple-y per se. I have seen some grapes be pineapple-y, but in the wine, typically it's more on the melon end of the spectrum. And if I threw up Dutton on there, it's going to be a lot more textural because we put a bit more wood, etc., on that one. Picking Chardonnay out here in the Russian River today. The guys are sorting through it. Beautiful, uh, beautiful little vineyard. We're just wrapping up here and should get this fruit into the vineyard at the winery in the next uh, hour or so. It'll be fantastic. This is some of the best Chardonnay that we make. And uh, you can see we've got big berries and small berries going in, in the same cluster. And this is what mass selection uh, Chardonnay is all about. It's beautiful, beautiful fruit. Little uh, melon and, and uh, sub, subtropical characters will come from this. Fantastic. No clones here, no clones. And for those who ask about malolactic, some of you may have heard of the term malolactic fermentation. So the main acid in grapes is tartaric. 
and then malic acid is the other one. And we add a bacteria to this. It's a secondary fermentation. So yeast ferment sugar to alcohol, and then malic is fermented to lactic using a bacteria. But we can change the amount of buttery character in the wine by doing some of these, these other things. So uh, I can make you a big fat buttery Chardonnay and it's got no malolactic in it. And I can make you a wine that's very lean and bright and yet it is 100% malolactic. So don't really worry about it. You know, just drink the wine and if you like it, cool. If you don't like it, then try something that's more, you know, either more buttery or less buttery. So what we do is with ours, I, I let it go native. So it's a native bacteria or natural bacteria. So we allow it to start in November uh, when it's relatively cool. And when it's cool, bacteria work pretty slowly. So November, December, January, February, March, when it just starts warming it up, warming up. Uh, we may go a little bit into April, which we've done this year, but basically we'll finish the ML wherever it is by April. So if you want to ask how much buttery character is in our wine, I would say it's about 20%, 25% in a big year. So, uh, you know, it's not an exact science and it never, it never tells you whether the wine is buttery or not anyway. So try and stay away from that question. This is what the wine looks like. It's, uh, for those who don't have the bottle in front of you, this is, a, um, this is the first and only label that we've ever done under this, under this um, brand. And as I said, we launched it with, um, with HEB. That was the first place and the first vintage that we ever did was only for HEB. Uh, continues to score in the 90s. So, and as I said at the beginning, it's probably the best value Russian River Chardonnay that you can get and uh, from and, and and also have it be unique, you know, be old vine Chardonnay. Really cool, man. I can, seriously, we drink this like water. It's just crazy. All right, jumping into um, making wines with our daughters. Uh, so when Chelsea, who's our oldest, was two, we traced around her head and she colored it in. That's where the label comes from. These labels have been updated recently in the last two years because we decided that the girls are old enough to have their own hair. And uh, so Chelsea's the oldest, Catherine was the middle child and Hillary's the youngest. Today, we're just gonna be talking about Catherine. You will notice that she faces a different direction to the other two because she's the middle child. And I don't know how many of you are middle children out there, so I'll try not to offend you, but basically they're the free thinkers, think outside the box, totally challenge their parents all the time. And I don't really believe in star sign, me personally, but I certainly believe in birth order. And for those who have never been to a class on birth order, I recommend going. It's a lot of fun. Where are the vineyards? Uh, so these, Alexander Valley looks like an upside down Y. So this is Cloverdale to the north, Healsburg. That blue dot is where I'm sitting right now. And that red dot is where I live. This is Dry Creek. When I say it's an upside down Y, this is the Russian River. It comes down here. And then we have Fitch Mountain. And Fitch Mountain blocks the river. So the river then flows around Fitch Mountain. So there's this part of the Y and then this part of the Y. The vineyards that we work on are either in this area or up here. I'll, we're not going to talk about these today, but these, this area is interesting because they face east. So they get morning sun. And by the time we get afternoon sun, they're in the shadow. To try and replicate that down here where the Catherine Vineyard is, we have to be on a little knoll. And so it's important for us to have shade um, so that we don't get the afternoon burn. So this vineyard, man, it's magic. It's been uh, a vineyard I've been working on for so, so long. There's a photo of the, uh, the five children and uh, pretending to work on this particular day. <laughs> it was a little bit hot and they got up a little bit late. Anyway, that's 2019 vintage. So the Cabernets that we make, we mainly work in Oakville. So I know that uh, Hillary, which is an Oakville Cabernet, Hillary Goldschmidt is, I'm pretty sure it's at HEB. And we're talking about Catherine and perhaps we'll jump into Yeoman because you'll see that Yeoman will appear on the slide. So Yeoman in Game Ranch, a very limited production as is Hillary, very limited production and slightly higher price point than, uh, than Hillary and Catherine. This is a picture of the vineyard itself. It's not really, it used to all be owned by one person, but today, the, this is a valley, really, and the valley uh, is now controlled by five growers, and we buy grapes from, from all of them, and uh, it's been a very successful area that we've worked in for many years, although at the moment I am developing another, another large property, which um, will not come into Catherine production until it's old enough. 
the fires for those who are interested, the 2008, uh, 19 fire, um, eight, 19, yeah, 19 fires came down here. Um, and this barn here that you'll see here, this barn here, it actually doesn't exist anymore. That barn was burnt, but vineyards don't burn. And we had, uh, this whole vineyard had been harvested prior to the fires. Uh, we only had about three, four vineyards out still in the fires. And for those who worry about smoke taint and this other nebulous term that people throw around, you cannot get smoke taint in a fire close to vintage. If you can imagine a leaf, a leaf during the growth season like now, if we had a fire now, it would be a big problem because those leaves are highly photosynthetic and they're absorbing everything around them. So if you, this is why you don't want to plant garlic, onion, or eucalypt trees next to vineyards or marijuana, by the way. Those oils will go onto the leaves and get absorbed into the grapes themselves. And so if we had a fire at that time, same thing would happen and you have this thing called smoke taint. Now it doesn't smell or taste smoky for those who think they've tasted it before. It actually tastes like menthol. So it's quite a different feeling than what you'd get from putting a wine in a barrel. Anyway, that, uh, so we were lucky that this vineyard, um, uh, we'd already harvested it. And this is what we call the Yeoman Vineyard and this is the Catherine Vineyard. So the Catherine Vineyard sits just down below, um, uh, I don't know who can put that heart up there, but that was really cool. Uh, the um, sits down below the Yeoman Vineyard. This is used for another project, but really unique site and a place that I've been working there for, for 90 years. So the key elements for Catherine or for this particular vineyard is that what we call Piedmont. So it's on a slope, it's east facing as I described. And so the, uh, as I said, the morning sun is more, more interesting. And by the way, it's also true in the, in the South Island too. People ask me that a lot. Is it the same in the, yes, in the, in the Southern hemisphere, the sun comes up in the same place as the Northern hemisphere. And yes, the water does go down the toilet the other way, by the way. Um, it has a pretty low yield because the vineyard is so old. I wouldn't call it low, I, I say low yield relative to the neighbors, but reality, I'd call it balanced yield. It's more because the vineyard is so old that when the vineyards become this old, they just produce enough crop that, uh, that they know that they can ripen. In the winery, we destem, we don't crush the grapes. We, we just take the, the, any rakuses off. We don't add any yeast. The only variety that we add yeast to actually is Zinfandel because Zinfandel is relatively hard to ferment. And then we don't make any additions or any final filtration later on. So uh, we use a single site specific winemaking, which uh, I think I'll talk about here in a minute. So this is a picture of the vineyard. You can see that what site specific winemaking means is trying to make the best wine that you possibly can from each site. So you can see here, the vines are extremely green and that means they're more vigorous, which also means they have less crop. So they're producing more um, uh, canopy than they are grapes. And so the ripening conditions are quite different. This is what we call the powerful area. Uh, this was a slip that had to be replanted. This is a powerful area where the vines are in more balance, crop and, uh, and um, canopy. And this is what we call the elegant area where the canopy is a little bit too small for the crop. So we actually take crop off. And uh, some of you guys have seen me, but this is a beautiful video because this is the last view that I have of our car that unfortunately our youngest daughter wrote off. Um, so for those who are feeling sympathetic towards our insurance needs, please feel free to buy some Hillary to support her, uh, her debt. So let me just, uh, yeah. So the interesting thing is in Bordeaux, if you look at flowering from, um, from flowering to harvest, we talk about a hundred days. Actually, I think I'm, I'm going to, uh, Mark, I'm just going to jump off here. I'm going to, no, I'm going to stay on. Uh, so the, the, luckily, the lucky thing is in California, we have or in Napa Sonoma is that we have about an extra 20 to 30 days beyond what they typically get in Bordeaux. So we have much more time for flavor and tannin ripeners. Uh, and that's really key because tannin, flavor, and sugar all ripen at different times. 
And that's the key part of a winemaker is going out there and tasting. And what I didn't understand was in that first vineyard that you, the first block that I described, the dense area where we have a lot of canopy and not a lot of crop, is what I didn't understand was the, um, the tannins, they, they move from, you know, they'll be green one week, then they go dusty and then they go dry and then they go ripe. Well, in a dense vineyard, they go green, dusty, dry, 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 raisin. Because what happens is in a big canopy, I hope you can see my face now, I just put my face up. What's, what happens is they can pull water out of the ground but then when they run out of moisture, you know, in September, October, now the only other moisture around is in the cluster. So that's why they start pulling moisture out of the cluster. And that's when you get raisins. And so that's when I started to learn, hey, dude, you know, I've got to be planting, I've got to be picking this dense vineyard much sooner than I anticipated. So the dense vineyard, which provides the weight, the power and the structure of the wine, I pick at 125 days. The elegant wines, which I know I can ripen for a lot longer period of time because they're much more fruity than they are tannic because those vines have got smaller canopy and we've now reduced the crop. That canopy can go on and on and on and I eat and I go, mm, you know, right, 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 right. It never goes to raisin. It's really interesting. Not until super long time. So when we bring that into the winery, we can extract the hell out of it, you know, because we know that that fruit is going to be more fruity than it is tannic. So that gives us the elegant wine. And then the powerful wine is somewhere in between. So my definition of complexity, and you'll see it in this video in a second, elegant wines, powerful wines, and dense wines. And you need all three of them to be a complex wine. And the unique thing about a property like this is we can get all three of those things on one property. And that's the definition of complexity and what makes making or drinking single vineyard wines a little bit more interesting. So yeah, it's an old, old vineyard. The location is fantastic. It's an old mass selection. This is actually called Jenkins and part of the vineyard is planted at Jackson. It's an old head prune vineyard. It is cane prune, but it is an old head prune. And we pick it relatively earlier because we want to have lower alcohol, better, brighter acidity, really accentuate what the Alexander Valley is about. And I'll say this, people ask me, when do you drink Alexander Valley and Napa Valley on the same night? Well, my answer is quite easy. I drink Alexander Valley with my food during dinner, and then I drink the Napa Valley with my cheese after dinner. Because the Alexander Valley is going to have more red fruit, more acidity, and when you drink that, you're going to go, man, I've got to have another glass, or I've got to eat something. When you drink Napa wine, it tends to have more, um, usually it has higher alcohol, which means it has more fructose, which is another sugar, and so your palate gets tired. And you don't want to be having a tired palate when you're eating a nice, fresh, Mediterranean dish. This is why Alexander Valley was invented. Anyway, site-specific winemaking, making the best possible wine that we possibly can from one particular site. And I've been working on this vineyard since 1990. Let's see if I can get that to run. All right, maybe I can't. G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm sitting here with three glasses of wine and everything we do is single vineyard and the way we get complexity out of a single vineyard is by choosing blocks and styles or working the wines to the way the vines best exemplify themselves. So when I was young, I walked into a room once at a pretty well-known winery with 200 wines on the table. I'm wondering how am I going to blend 200 wines? I came from New Zealand, I didn't know anything about Cabernet. And so working with a consultant, we figured out the best way to do this is to put them into families. Elegant wines, which are the soft berry fruit wines right up on front of the tongue. The powerful wines, which provide the fleshiness and the richness. And the dense wines, which give us structure and power. So when we go ahead and line all those wines up, I sorted all the elegant wines together and I, made a, I chose the best elegant wines and made a blend. I got the best powerful wines and made a blend, the best dense wines and made a blend. And we had three wines all from the same vineyard, all from maybe in the same block or not the same block, but all from the same vineyard. And then we made a blend of these three wines and it was the most complex wine that we could possibly make. So today I continue that process. With elegant wines, we can extract them a little bit more aggressively because we know that the tannins are in a lower concentration than the fruit, so we can extract more tannin. 
Whereas on a dense wine, if we made wine like that, they become too dry and too tannic. So we lower the extraction and try and make the wines more fruit forward. So if I was to drink an elegant wine, I'm gonna get more red cherry, Great structure, very forward in the mouth, very, very elegant, very ripe, but good acidity, red fruit, and very forward in the mouth. The powerful wine, I can immediately get it. It's more black cherry, a little bit of walnut. And the mouth is really rich, really full, powerful. Not a lot going on in the front of the mouth, not a lot going on in the structural part of the mouth either. And then the dense wines, much more chocolate, a lot more black cherry, but all finished, very supple tannins, good structure, good acidity. And so when we put the three together, hopefully, and it's never 30, 30, 30, because in a warm vintage, I probably want a little bit more of the dense component, whereas in a cool vintage, I want more of the elegant component. So it really depends on the vintage. And when I put all three together, we get the most complex wine we possibly can from the same vineyard. And that's how we make single vineyard wines really complex. So this is the wine uh, that you're drinking, most of you, hopefully, some of you. If not, run on down to your HEB and get some of this. It's not too bad. And uh, again, really good value. For an Alexander Valley, it's killer. Uh, this one... Got a, I only got 92 points. I don't know what happened. Anyway, uh, 2018 was a pretty rambunctious uh, uh, vintage, pretty similar to what I'd consider 2013 to be. 2013 and 18 are pretty similar vintages, um, but definitely more on the powerful, powerful end of the spectrum. So in that, in uh, 2018, we had to really dial in how much elegant wine that we were able to put in to bring that wine together. But yeah. Nice red berry, you know, it's, this is obviously a wine writer's statement, but for me, you know, how you get, when I talked about warm fruit and cool fruit with Chardonnay, this is the same thing. So we want to be, the descriptors for me are red cherry, blueberry, black cherry, right in that mid fruit. Napa Valley would start at blueberry, blueberry, black cherry, you know, plum, that sort of, those sort of characters. So a little bit cooler in, um, in terms of black fruits in the Napa Valley. Although remember, Alexander Valley is cooler than the Napa Valley, and that's why we have better acidity and more food-friendly wines in the Alexander Valley. Nick, can you hear me for a couple of questions? Yeah. Why don't the boys' wines have, have wines named after them? Oh, boy. I don't know if boys are worthy, are they? <laughs> um, for those who are interested, I'm going to be doing a, uh, a webinar tomorrow with... Um, uh, my son, who's actually a winemaker, he, he just got back from Argentina. He was making wine at Catena. And, but his resume is Opus, Arasuris in Chile, Louis Latour in Burgundy, um, Penfolds in Australia, Campo Viejo in Spain, and then Catena in Argentina. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what a millennial, I guess he's a millennial, thinks about wine and, and what he's seen. So for those who are interested, uh, you can reach out a little bit later. You've got my email on here if you want to join me at nine o'clock tomorrow morning, California time. Yeah, anybody that wants an invite to that, I think this is going to be quite fun to, to, to see Luke in action with Dad. Uh, so uh, another question that's come through from Alessandro in San Antonio is regarding new up and coming things, variety wise, um, winemaking technique, et cetera, that uh, might stand out around the world right now. Anything wow. stand out? Okay, uh, that is a really, okay, so there's, in terms of varieties, um, the problem is you can't make, you can't make them, I mean, the consumer doesn't, they're not that interested, so you can only make one or 200 cases of these new varieties, but there's no new varieties. What their varieties are is being rediscovered. So taking some of the, as we get global change, I don't want to call it global warming because I'm not, I'm not quite sure about global warming, but I am sure about global change. We are getting out, our, our vintages are changing, that's for sure. But what I find interesting is taking the same variety that you know and love and turning it into something else fun and unique. So one of the things I've been playing around with in Canada and I learned in Chile, and um, if I can get my assistant winemaker to get on board with me here, 
is skin contact semion. So putting it in a, uh, a pot, uh, we've been putting these grapes in pots. They hold about half a ton clay pots and we seal the pot for two years with no SO2, 100% skin contact. And, it, and everyone goes, dude, that's orange wine. You know, you're going to get more astringency. And, 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 but no, you don't. That doesn't happen. What happens is somehow this liquid becomes the same color as what you typically get for a Semillon or a Chardonnay. It's beautiful color. You don't have, you know, we can make it with very, very low levels of SO2 because the wine is extremely stable because it went through its brown phase without me looking at it. So I didn't have to worry about it. And then on the red side of really... I garnered a lot of interest. You know, we've started replanting things like Carignanum, Vedra, etc., and we've really struggled with those varieties. And and uh, so last year, 2019 vintage, Mark hasn't even tried it yet. But a friend of mine, I've known of, I've known her for a long time. She inherited about 50 acres from her father, her and her sister, and she said, oh, "I've got some grapes for sale." I said, "What do you got?" She goes. Oh, 150-year-old Carignan. I said, what? Where is it? So I went up and saw this property. It's dry-farmed Carignan. She has big vines and small vines. And, and a lot of those um, big vines were pulled out and put back in with small vines. But the big vines are exactly what I wanted to make Carignan from. So we made, uh, we made a couple of ton of it this year. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do. We have a label called Grace Point that we might put under. I might talk to HEB, see if they're interested. But... Really unique. I mean, unbelievably spicy and peppery, but with great acidity and uh, but not offensive. I mean, so many old Caribbeans have so much acidity, I can't even you know, use them as Drano. But this one was fantastic. And, you know, uh, Claudia gave it to me the other day. And I'm like, shoot, what is this? It's like this great acidity, bright, you know, because we were drinking Cabernet that day. And then she just gave me the Caribbean on the end of the tasting. Look out for it. It's going to be great. We just gave it a little bit of, I'm going to give it a touch of wood and then we're going to bottle it. Did that um, answer the question? I'm not sure. Yeah, kind of. I'm, I'm going to tee you up. 2016 Yeoman, just arriving in Texas. Maybe as much as 20% of it for Texas. I, I'm working with Yolan on that. Uh, small production, 330 cases. Powerful or elegant? 2016 is a really uh, unique vintage. Um, I was going to do a vintage chart a little bit later if we have time, if not. But 16 is a more elegant vintage. So uh, looking at, just so you guys know the context of great vintages. I mean, 2012 was probably one of the, in recent memories, one of the greatest vintages. 1986, which was the first year I ever blended wine in the Alexander Valley would be another one. 86. Um, uh, show us. Show us. You want me to do? Do <laughs> it. Okay, um, let me take my microphone off. We'll put it back on, actually. I, I'll see if you guys can uh, hear me. And I'm going to plug the microphone in so you won't be able to hear me. Um, uh, so if we were to graph... Um, if we were to rank... Um, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I'm kind of a graphic guy. Sorry, Mark. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to fade, fade you away for a minute. The, uh, if we were going to put elegant vintages, powerful vintages, and not so interesting vintages. So uh, 1980, 81, 80, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, Nineteen, I think, is going to be a little bit more elegant when it comes out, and twenty twenty is going to be sort of in that realm. But if you did this in France, 
you'd have this many good vintages and this many bad vintages. The other thing to remember is if you eliminate the 80s, we don't have that many bad vintages. 98 and 08 have also been questioned by wine writers now because those wines are actually fantastic, especially 08. It's a really rich vintage. 2011, I would question as well because remember, California is the same length as New Zealand, the same length of Japan, same length of England, and it rained in Paso Robles. It takes me seven hours to get down to Paso Robles. So I do not consider 2011 to be a bad vintage. In fact, drinking a 2011 now, I had a bottle um, two nights ago. Oh, man, unbelievable. Because it's really red fruit, really exemplifies what Alexander Valley, and, well, it was an Alexander Valley that I had. I'm sure the Napa will be just as good. So anyway, this is the Nick Goldschmidt wall of vintages, whether you believe it or not. But I mean, when, you, when people talk to me about, well, what's the difference between 14, 15, 16, 17, 18? Not that much. It's not that big a deal. It's not like when you're so far south in southern part of Chile or southern part of New Zealand or some parts of, of uh, France. We just don't get the extremes in vintages that a lot of other countries do. Anyway, hope that answers it all, Mark. So California's easy. Oh, my God. That's why I live in California. It's the easiest place in the world to make wine. Okay, quick on fidelity. So, um, fidel what we uh, the the wine that we want to talk about today, real quickly, just at the end, is is fidelity Zinfandel. For those who um, have not seen this wine, this is a this wine we started making because a friend of mine was going bankrupt. He had sold his winery and he'd sold the contract for his grapes for three years and he hadn't been paid. So he called me up and said, Nick, can you help me? So I went up to the winery. I tasted all the wine. I'm like, dude, man, these wines are fantastic because the winemaker is actually really good too. And I said, let's pump all the Cabernet, Merlot, Franc and Petit Bordeaux from, from uh, 2000 into one tank, 2001 into another tank, 2002. And I called up a mate of mine. He, he happened to be the buyer for a small little retail store you may have heard of called Walmart Sands Club. And uh, we launched it on Valentine's Day. We called it Fidelity. We put a heart on the label. Everything went really well until uh, 18 months, two years later, he calls me up and goes, Nick, I can't sell the last five, 600 cases. I'm like, ah, oh, man, come on, man. I'm still working for Simi. I'm still trying to help this guy out, you know? And so I called up my distributor in New Jersey, Massachusetts and Indiana and the three distributors decided to take the 500 cases. Next day, 92 points, best buy wine enthusiast. The wine buyer from Walmart calls me up and says, hey man, can I get my wine back? So today, there's a broken heart on the label. And this is, this is like, we don't sell this wine to large factory stores like that. So uh, let's leave the names out of it, but those, um, those, I'm sure you know who those stores are, and we're honored to actually have it at HEB because uh, I think that's probably the biggest um, set of stores that uh, Fidelity is in. But really unique place, and uh, we try to make it a lower alcohol. It's a vineyard that we actually own in Geyserville. There was a, right up in that very first slide I showed, showed the map, you uh, could see that. Uh, and this is just a picture of Geyserville, and the vineyard actually sits right in Geyserville. This is the town of Geyserville. And the vineyard, or oh, there's a town of Geyserville, and there's the vineyard. Uh, it's an old mass selection that's planted on St. George, which is the original rootstock that the Italians planted. Super old vineyard, super gentle extraction. We, we're really, really careful with this wine. And um, G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here, winemaker for Trig Point Zinfandel. I am squinting into the sun. Whoa, check that out. And I'm standing out here in Rail Yard Zinfandel land. Down the end there, we have two railway lines. And Rail Yard is also the name of a rugby stadium that was imploded in New Zealand a few years back and it's quite fortuitous because right now we've got the uh, the World Cup of Rugby going on. Anyway let's check out some Zinfandel here. Uh, we come in here this is probably one of the best sets I've ever seen for Zin. Big even, not too much raisining although the cluster next door has a bit of raisining. Hope you can see that so we'll check out I just put a couple of berries in my mouth. I just spat the pulp out. And now I'm chewing the skin. Lots of good tannin, lots of good flavor. And then spat again. You can see how purple it was. And that indicates to me that we're very close to harvest. In fact, 
we got this down to pick in about five days. Anyway, awesome. Trig Point Zinfandel out here in Rail Yard in the Alexander Valley. Sweet ass. And this is the wine. It um, just got 92 points in the spectator, so it's been uh, running off the shelves. And because um, it's such a great value, there's not many Zinfandels at this price point. And also, we make a red blend under the same label. So these are the only wines that I make uh, that are blended varietals. So if it doesn't say Fidelity, if it's Singing Tree, Catherine, Boulder Bank, it's 100% one vineyard, one vintage, one variety. But Fidelity, the Zinfandel, we put a little bit of Petit Serrara in it, which is also another old Italian variety. And for the red blend, it's still the traditional blend that we made with the original owner, Cabernet, Merlot, Franc, and Petit. So yeah, great wine if you can get a bottle of that. Uh, so just wrapping up, um, everything we do is one vintage variety, vineyard and vegan, except for the Fidelity. These are real places, real stories, real growers. These are not uh, negotiant wines where we run around and buy a bunch of bulk from, from various entities and, and put them all together in one big blend. Uh, we've been, I've been living here since 1990, so this is my 30, 31st vintage. <laughs> The neighbors for Boulder Bank are Cloudy Bay Martyr and Stonely, which I talked about. Alan Scott, you probably don't know Alan Scott. Singing Tree is uh, Goldfield, Kokomo, Papa Pietro, and Sonoma Catrera is just over the fence. And then the Catherine Vineyard, the Jordan, Silver Oak, Robert Young, uh, which are also down in that southern part of the valley. So come and visit us. Uh, we have a little tasting room out in Dry Creek that will be opening hopefully June 1st or whenever we finish SIP in place. And um, those are my contacts. Please feel free to reach out. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we have a huge uh, YouTube following as well, but um, you can pretty much find us through the website. If you go to www.goldschmidtvineyards.com, you'll find the YouTube channel, and you can certainly go there and, and uh, join. And there's a lot of these educational videos that I've done, and then um, videos of each one of the wines and vineyards that a uh, little bit of what you saw today. So anyway, I really want to thank... Uh, you all attending for today and, and obviously HEB for supporting a small family entrepreneurial business such as ours. Uh, we certainly can't do without them. And hopefully uh, with your enthusiasm for the brand now, you'll run into the stores, buy some of these wines that you've tasted and looked at today and encourage HEB to celebrate by sending me another purchase order. Anyway, enough from me. Any other questions out there, Mark? Thank you, Nick. Thank you, HEB. I think it's time to wrap it up.